Okay, so uh, this is the third piece of the, the puzzle for the evening. Um, and again, talking about what we're learning from scanning kids these days, I'm going to talk about another group of brain regions that we're um, looking at in the same set of studies um, that are part of the answer to a question, which is how do kids learn to think about other people's thoughts? And it actually occurs to me I'm going to have sound. So let's hope this works. Okay. We'll see what happens. Okay, so um, here's the puzzle in my research, which is that um, what I study is how people think about other people's thoughts. And the, the problem with trying to study that, as Philip Roth posed it, is that we're asking how people can envision one another's interior workings and invisible aims. That is, we're trying to understand how people perceive things about others that are literally invisible. So unlike the stuff that Nancy and Danny have been telling you about up until now, where the puzzle was for a set of visible objects that we experience all the time, how does the brain process those kinds of things, faces and scenes and objects? The question we're asking about is for a set of things that are always invisible, the insides of other people's heads, how could a person ever or a brain ever learn to figure those things out? And one intuition that's appealing is to think, well, if you need to figure out what's inside somebody else's head, you can rely on the fact that other people are pretty similar to you. They have had similar experiences to you, and even better, they have very similar bodies and physical actions to you. So maybe you've done a lot of exactly the same things that you're seeing other people do. You've made the same faces, you've been in the same postures, and so you can use the fact that you have very similar experiences to other people as a bridge across the differences between you and them. So that's an idea that many neuroscientists have been interested in recently, um, and you may have heard some of the press about mirror neurons, a class of neurons discovered in monkeys that might support that kind of bridge. And I think that's super interesting, but it's not what I'm going to talk about, because for me, that's the easy part of the problem, and I want to work on the hard part of the problem. So the hard part of the problem is what about all the cases where we're trying to understand experiences of other people, beliefs and desires and thoughts and emotions that aren't exactly the same as the things we have or are currently experiencing? What if we want to know about the minds of people who are different from ourselves? So what if you want to know what this woman is thinking even though you yourself has ne have never had a child and so have never done anything like look at your own baby? Or what this man is thinking even though you've never jumped off a cliff? So, in order to get into the head of somebody who's different from ourselves, we need a whole different kind of process, and that's uh, what I study in my research. And the beginning of this literature also comes from about 30 or 40 years ago from the invention of a task that lets us study the development in little kids, the first glimmers of this idea that other people have different beliefs and desires than they themselves have, that other people's minds are these invisible, different, other uh, minds. And that task is called the false belief task. And rather than describe it to you, I'm just going to let you watch a kid take this um, test. This child is five years old. And um, this, is, this pattern of performance is what we call passing the false belief task. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Let's try this. puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what? I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes. And it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich and he says, Yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That one's Joshua's. Then, That's right. And then his is on the ground. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, so he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now Joshua goes off to get a drink. Ivan comes back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. Well, which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he's going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh, yeah, you were right. He took that one. Okay, so the idea here is that kids need to be able to figure out that even though they know which sandwich is Ivan's, his sandwich is the one on the ground, that Ivan, different from them, doesn't know and thinks that the sandwich on the chest is his, the one where he left it. And so that lets them predict what he's going to do, namely take the wrong sandwich, and explain why he did it. And this kid, as you saw, anticipated the problem even before I asked him. As soon as the sandwiches got switched, he saw what was coming and predicted there was going to be this problem. He wouldn't know which one was his. Um, so that's a five-year-old, and what originally caught people's attention about this task was what you see if you ask the same question to a three-year-old. So this is now going to be a three-year-old who's followed the story with equally rapt attention. And Ivan says, I want my cheese sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to take? You think he's going to take that one? Let's see what happens. Let's see what he does. Here comes Ivan, and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. He takes this one. So the three-year-old does two things differently, and this is what caught people's attention. First of all, they're not stumped. They don't find this question hard. They confidently predict exactly the opposite. If he says he wants his sandwich, he's going to take his sandwich, and that's that. He said he wanted it, that one's his, and he's going to take it. And then when they see that's not what happened, he took the other sandwich. Why did he take the other sandwich? What a five-year-old would say is, well, he thought that one was his. That's where he left his sandwich. But what the three-year-old does is look for another explanation in terms of desires. Namely, why wouldn't he want his own sandwich? Well, his own sandwich fell on the ground. Maybe he doesn't want his own sandwich anymore. So he's taking the other sandwich because his sandwich is on the ground and he doesn't want it anymore. So this pattern of performance in three-year-olds um, which is called failing the false belief task, is actually much more interesting than failing. And this pattern has now been seen all over the world in hundreds of studies and thousands of children. The kids at five do what we do, say he's going to take the one he thinks is his, even though that's not the one that's really his. Kids at three do the opposite. If he wants his sandwich, he should take the one that's his. And they have to come up with these other explanations if something else is what happens. This has been shown to be culturally universal. It happens the same way all over the world, including a hunter-gatherer tribe in Africa. Um, and the, the key exception, again, that really got people's attention was um, kids diagnosed with aut autistic spectrum disorders who seem to have a specific problem answering this kind of question, even compared to other equally complicated, equally hard logical puzzles. And so that pattern of this culturally universal pattern of change in performance with an exception in a developmental disease made people think back when these patterns were first observed in the early 80s, well, maybe there's a special brain system that lets us do this. And that would explain this pattern. It's a special brain system just in humans and universal to humans. And it develops at a particular time in a particular way. That's why we see this pattern of change universally. And that brain system can be the target of a disease like autism and then you will get this atypical pattern of performance in autism. So that was the idea. But in the 80s, there wasn't any easy way to test it. And so we had to wait for the invention of, of tools that would let us do neuroscience on human children um, before we could ask these questions. And now there are such tools. Um, the main one that we're talking about today is ways of measuring blood flow, like PET and fMRI. Um, and that's what I'll talk about for now, although I should note there are also other tools um, EEG and MEG, which are ways of measuring the electrical and magnetic activity in the brain, um, which we can also do in kids and even in much younger children because it doesn't involve a great big magnet. Um, and then tools that let us selectively disrupt one brain region at a time that we don't do in kids. We only do this in consenting adults. Um, but so for today, I'm going to talk about kid data, and I'm only going to talk about these blood flow measurements, the same kinds of things that Nancy and Danny were talking about. So we set out to ask, actually I did this with Nancy 10 years ago, we set out to ask, okay, there's a hypothesis, there's a special brain system for solving false belief tasks, can we find it? 
And we first did this in adults. So adults would basically do a grown-up version of the pirate problem that I gave to the kids in those videos. They'd read short stories. And some of those short stories um, would be like this one. John told Emily he has a Porsche. Actually, he has a, a Ford. Emily doesn't know anything about cars, so she believes John. And now we can ask either, what kind of car does John really have? Or what kind of car does Emily think John has? And that lets us get at people's ability to think about beliefs when they're different from reality. And then some of the other stories, again, describe things that could be true or false, but now they're not about beliefs, they're about photographs. So for example, a photograph is taken of an apple hanging on a tree branch. The film takes a while to develop. This is, of course, 10 years ago when film took a while to develop. And in the meantime, a strong wind blows the apple to the ground. And now we can ask, where's the apple really? And where's the apple in the photograph? Of course, many brain regions are involved to do either one of these. You have to be able to read. You have to be able to make a response. You have to be able to think about a logical puzzle. So lots of brain regions are recruited for both of these tasks. But we wanted to know, were there any brain regions that got more active just for the belief stories and not for the other stories? Um, and we use the same fMRI tools to do it. We did it in a population we call typical human adults. They're MIT undergraduates. And when you do that and you ask where in the brain is there a differential response, you see there's a bunch of brain regions that seem to have a higher activity when people are reading just about beliefs compared to photographs. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on one of them, which is above and behind your right ear. It's called the right temporoparietal junction. And that's because it has a very interesting pattern of response, both in adults and in kids. OK, so is this a specialized brain region for thinking about other people's thoughts? In exactly the same way that Nancy said, what we now have to do is sort out all the other things that could have accounted for that activity, all the other things that might be different between the belief stories and the photograph stories. And I'm just going to show you some of them, because this has been 10 years of nailing down the specialization of this brain region. So I'll show you one experiment that we did in the adults. So for this, we had adults read three new kinds of stories. One kind is about thoughts. So not false beliefs, just thoughts. So for example, Nikki knew his sister's flight from San Francisco was delayed 10 hours. Only one flight was delayed so much that night. So when he got to the airport, he knew that flight was hers. So that is, an, hopefully, if this brain region is involved in thinking about thoughts, it will respond when people read that kind of story. And now we want to know, is it specific to thoughts, or is it anything about people, even maybe anything invisible about people's insides? So we put a second kind of story, which is about people's sensations. So for example, Sheila skipped breakfast because she was late for the train to her mother's. By the time she got off the train, she was starving, her stomach was rumbling, and she could smell food everywhere. So that has a lot of the same features as the thought stories. It's about other people. It's about their internal sensations, stuff you can't necessarily see from the outside. But now it's not about thoughts. It's just about feelings. Well, even more like sensations. And then the third class, again, still about people, but now even less like thoughts, is stuff you can see from the outside, people's physical appearance. So Andrew had just had a growth spurt, so he was gangly and rather awkward. Like most teenagers, he had bad skin and bad taste in clothes. He wore mostly baggy jeans and flannel shirts. Okay, so now we can say, these brain regions, do they respond to anything about people? Just people's sensations and thoughts, or really just thoughts? Um, so we look inside this brain region in each person. Um, and here's the average pattern of response. Again, over time, time is running along the x-axis, percent response, just like Danny is going up and down. Um, so this is the response when they're reading the stories about thoughts. And again, you can see this big, robust response when they're reading about thoughts. This is when they're reading about people's physical appearance. And you can see there's no change from zero. It's like we didn't put anything on the screen at all. This brain region doesn't know there's anything there. So only when the content includes thoughts. And even if the, if the thing we look at is physical sensations, like hunger and thirst, there's still no response. So we can only kick this brain region into gear by making you think about somebody else's thoughts. Well, that's true in grown-ups, but what about in kids? Um, and so now I'm going to tell you what we're doing now with scanning your kids. Um, and this is we're trying to address basically three key questions about the development of this brain region. Very similar to the stuff Danny said. The first one is, when do kids get these brain regions? Unlike face perception, there might be reason to think this could develop much later. Face perception kids are good at really early. But this is something, as we saw, that three and five and maybe even older kids 
f seven year old kids are still working out. In fact, sometimes I feel like undergrads and even professors are still working out. So maybe there's a lot more time to see the process of development in these brain regions. Second, um, can we show that developmental change in those brain regions is what helps you get better at thinking at, about other people's thoughts, right? That's what we really want to know um, about development. And then, is there something atypical about these brain regions um, in kids with autism, going back to the original reason we set out to look for these brain regions in the first place? Okay. So, for the first question, when do kids get these brain regions? To ask that, again, we need charming, child-friendly versions of our tasks. So just like they had to make, N Nancy and Danny needed um, videos that were child-friendly for the faces, we needed audio versions. We couldn't ask the kids to read. Some of them are five. And they needed to be child-friendly. So we made a whole new set of stories for children about the same kinds of ideas. Um, so first of all, I'm going to play Lee, you. When she turned 10, she discovered why her friends were disappearing. So they some of the stimuli. Taken to Garberville by a lonely and selfish fairy. Lee Chi felt very mad and sad when she thought about her friends so far away from their families. She wanted to do something to help. Okay, so obviously that's about a character's thoughts and feelings and desires and goals. Here's the next condition. The new girl in the class was dressed in the same clothes as everyone else, but she still looked different. Her eyes weren't blue or green or brown. They were yellow, and her hair wasn't blonde or brown or black. It was green. Okay, so that's stuff, the physical appearance of people, stuff you can see from the outside. And then the last condition is the physical environment. In the tiny town of Chew and Swallow, it rained or snowed three times each day, once during breakfast, once during lunch, and once during dinner. But it never rained rain and it never snowed snow. It rained things like soup and juice, and snowed things like mashed potatoes. Okay. So that's kid versions of stories about people's thoughts, their physical appearance, and the physical environment. OK, so first we can ask, um, are the basic brain regions for thinking about other people there already in kids now age 5 to 12? Um, so for reference, this is again the data from adults. Um, the, re the red arrow points to the right TPJ, but as I said, there are these other brain regions as well. Um, and this is actually in these stories, so the adults now listening to the, to the kids' stories. And now what about a group of kids? So this was the first group of kids we studied, and they have actually exactly the same pattern of brain activity. If we ask overall, is there any significant difference? There is no significant difference. And as you see, there's a robust response. To the in the right TPJ to the mental stories compared to the physical environment. But the fact that these brain regions are there and are actually the same size, just like Danny showed, is not the whole story because we also want to know about selectivity. This is the same kind of idea that Danny said. Is this brain region in kids like it is in adults just for thinking about other people's thoughts? Or does it start out with a kind of more general portfolio and specialize with development? And so to look at that, we have to look at the response to each of the three conditions. So this is the adults in the child-friendly stories, but the same pattern of data I showed you before. Big response for stories about mental stuff, no response for stories about the physical environment, or other stuff about people that isn't their mental states. So that's grown-ups. That's eight adults. And now if we look at 10 kids age 8 to 12, it starts to look a little bit different. Like maybe the social condition is a little bit higher in the 8 to 12 year old kids than it is in the adults. And that's most obvious in the 5 to 8 year old kids, where there's actually no difference between mental stuff and other social stuff. Both of those get a high response. So it looks like in 5, five to 8 year olds, this is a brain region that does anything about people. And over the time between being 5 and being a grown up, this brain region is, is specializing its function, going from being a generalist about social stuff to being a specialist just about other people's minds. So that's the first thing. These kids, although they have these brain regions and they're doing something social by five, they're not fully mature until at least eight or nine and maybe, maybe later. So that's cool because that lets us ask, does developing these brain regions, does getting a specialized right TPJ make you better at thinking about other people's thoughts? And so we can do that by asking kids, 
harder problems. We obviously can't ask our five to 12 year olds to do the basic task that I showed you in the first video because the five year olds are all already perfect. But we can devise harder problems that tax them a little bit more and then ask, okay, what about on the harder problems? Is there a relationship between how they do on those hard problems and how selective their brain region is? So one of those hard problems is taking the same story and turning it into a moral problem. And so I'm going to show you again the same kids being asked this story as a moral question. This is the three-year-old who, remember, he thinks Ivan took Joshua's sandwich only because his own was dirty and he didn't want it anymore. Critically, by the way, Joshua came back, saw Ivan eating his sandwich, and started to cry. So a harm has occurred. Joshua is crying because Ivan's eating his sandwich. And now I can ask a moral question. Joshua's sandwich? Yeah. yeah. Should Ivan get in trouble for taking Joshua's sandwich? Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. He took Joshua's sandwich because he didn't want his own. That is mean he should get in trouble. Now here's the five-year-old who, remember, was so good at predicting what Ivan would do. He predicted what Ivan would do before I asked the question. He saw it coming. Was Ivan being mean and naughty for taking Joshua's sandwich? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So even though he knows exactly why Ivan took the sandwich, he predicted it in advance, he still can't use the fact of Ivan's false belief to make the moral judgment we would make, that because he thought it was his own sandwich, he's not being mean for eating it, even though it caused Joshua to cry. And not until seven years old do we see kids giving something more like an adult response. Should Ivan get in trouble for taking Joshua's sandwich? No, because we didn't get in trouble. So he says the wind should get in trouble for switching the sandwiches, right, causing the problem in the first place. Okay, so this kind of question lets us ask a harder problem that taps kids' abilities to think about other people's thoughts and use that in context um, that's harder, so more appropriate for the kids age 5 to 12. Those of you who've been here know that we do this with a little booklet where there's pieces of the booklet that are attached by magnets and kids can move those pieces around by magnets. In this booklet, it's all about giving kids the book they want to read for reading time. And sometimes one kid steals the other kid's book because they falsely believe it's their own book. And we can ask, are they being mean for stealing the other kid's book? So now we can ask for each kid, how well did they do in our booklet? And how selective was the response in their right TPJ. Um, and so this is just the first data that we collected asking that. And what you can see is that, so across the x-axis is how good, how well they performed on the books. And on the y-axis is how selective their right TPJ is. And you can see basically kids who do better on the booklets have more adult-like, more selective right TPJs. And actually, this is true even after we account for age. So effectively, for kids the same age, if you're both seven, the ones with the more selective right TPJ also do better on the books. OK, so that lets us say that developing or maturing these brain regions, making them more selective, goes along with being better at thinking about other people's thoughts. And so now we come to the third question, which is, is there anything atypical about these brain regions in the kids with autism who, remember, have selective trouble with these kinds of false belief tasks? Um, and that's the major question we're hoping to work on next. We don't know yet. Um, and so that's it for now. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is my lab, by the way. And that, because of Ellen, that was us making um, plasticine neurons, <laughs> which is way more fun than what we normally do. <laughs> so, so on uh, those MRI diagrams, you also saw other regions of the brain uh -huh. lighting up. Yeah. So our, our, uh, is there research going on around those regions as yeah. well? Yeah. So of course in every experiment we do, we study all of them. And the reason I focused on this one brain region is it has a, a particularly beautiful pattern. So each of those other brain regions we're also constantly studying and trying to figure out what's going on in them. Um, and one that's quite interesting, interesting in particular because it's so different from the right TPJ. Um, let me see if I can get back to it. is this one here, 
which is about half an inch behind the middle of your forehead. It's called the medial prefrontal cortex. And that brain region has a, does a totally different thing from the right TPJ. It, it doesn't get more selective at all. It's already, it basically never gets very selective. It, it remain, this brain region basically remains a generalist for social cognition. It continues to respond to almost any social information about other people. And so it's not changing over development. Um, and so one of the things that this hints, this starts to hint at is that you start out with this group of brain regions. Either you start out or the interesting story on how they get there is between zero and five. Right, of course, we don't know which. But by five, you have this connected group of brain regions for social stuff. And now, among those brain re regions, specialization starts to happen, where they all were doing the same thing. Now they start dividing up the labor. And that's an idea I find really intriguing, this idea that these brain regions, first of all, sort out that they're the ones doing social stuff. And then amongst themselves, basically, divide up the labor of social cognition, some taking on thoughts, others taking on other stuff. Um, but exactly what the other stuff is is a mystery. And the worst behaved brain region is this one, totally promiscuous, does absolutely everything. So that brain region is involved in autobiographical memory and all kinds of emotional stuff at any time you think about yourself as well as other people. So finding that brain region is always annoying because um, it does everything. And so when you see it, well, not everything, but it does a lot, a lot of different stuff. So when you see it, it's very, in any one context, you can't say, oh, that's because of this, because it just shows up in so many other kinds of contexts. It's also, by the way, activity there correlates with if you're reading arguments made by somebody on the other side of a political argument from you, how mad you get at them. The more mad you get at them, the more activity in that brain region. So it, it, this is a brain region that does all interesting things, but so many things that it just, it's, yeah, I think it's very badly behaved. So, My favorite is the right TBJ, which behaves like a surf circus animal. You give it a hoop, it jumps through it. Thank you, um, Rebecca and Nancy and Danny, and thank you to those of you who have brought your children in, because really we couldn't do any of this without you. It's been a lot of fun working with you. And for those of you who are here, who um, have children who might want to be involved, there are flyers in the back, little cards that have um, my telephone number and our website on there. And I'd be happy to talk to you about um, what it's like to bring your children in. And there are plenty of cookies in the back that you're all welcome to uh, take with you, please. <laughs> we'll hang out for a few minutes. going to let you watch a kid take this um, test. This child is five years old and um, this, is, this pattern of performance is what we call passing the false belief test. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Let's try this. I did. Am I plugging the wrong one in? Let's try that. This is the first tire. His name is Ivan. You know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 yum. I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, saying, what if we want to know about the minds of people who are different from ourselves? So what if you want to know what this woman is thinking, even though you yourself have, ne have never had a child, and so have never done anything like look at your own baby? Or what this man is thinking, even though you've never jumped off a cliff? So in order to get into the head of somebody who's different from ourselves, we need a whole different kind of process. And that's uh, what I study in my research. And the beginning of this literature also comes from about 30 or 40 years ago from the invention of a task that lets us study the development in little kids, the first glimmers of this idea that other people have different beliefs and desires than they themselves have, that other people's minds are these invisible, different other uh, minds. And that task is called the false belief task. And rather than describe it to you, I'm just... Okay, so uh, this is the third piece of... The, the puzzle for the evening. Um, and again, talking about what we're learning from scanning kids these days, I'm going to talk about another group of brain regions that we're um, looking at in the same set of studies. 
um, that are part of the answer to a question, which is, how do kids learn to think about other people's thoughts? And it actually occurs to me, I'm going to have sound. So let's hope this works. OK. We'll see what happens. OK. So um, here's the puzzle in my research, which is that um, what I study is how people think about other people's thoughts. And the, the problem with trying to study that, as Philip Roth posed it, is that we're asking how people can envision one another's interior workings and invisible. And a lot of exactly the same things that you're seeing other people do. You've made the same faces. You've been in the same postures. And so you can use the fact that you have very similar experiences to other people as a bridge across the differences between you and them. So that's an idea that many neuroscientists have been interested in recently. Um, and you may have heard some of the press about mirror neurons, a class of neurons discovered in monkeys that might support that kind of bridge. And I think that's super interesting, but it's not what I'm going to talk about. Because for me, that's the easy part of the problem. And I want to work on the hard part of the problem. So the hard part of the problem is, what about all the cases where we're trying to understand experiences of other people, beliefs and desires and thoughts and emotions that aren't exactly the same as the things we have or are currently experienceable aims. That is, we're trying to understand how people perceive things about others that are literally invisible. So unlike the stuff that Nancy and Danny have been telling you about up until now, where the puzzle was for a set of visible objects that we experience all the time, how does the brain process those kinds of things, faces and scenes and objects? The question we're asking about is for a set of things that are always invisible, the insides of other people's heads, how could a person ever or a brain ever learn to figure those things out? And one intuition that's appealing is to think, well, if you need to figure out what's inside somebody else's head, you can rely on the fact that other people are pretty similar to you. They have had similar experiences to you. And even better, they have very similar bodies and physical actions to you. So maybe you've d 